anyway, moving on from me not knowing anything, let's talk to somebody that knows a lot. Let's talk about fucking Cat Williams. Yo, big up Robert Henry Perra, appreciate you. No more gatekeepers in 2024. Let's do it, bro. You know, perfect timing to Robert Henry Poe. Appreciate you for the super chat, my friend. Perfect timing. You have perfect fucking timing, bro. You coomed at the right fucking time. You bust at the right fucking moment. No fucking pause. Big up my guy, Robert Henry Poet. Let's fucking go. So, talking about one person who knows about no gatekeepers, let's talk about Cat Williams. So, I re again, that Cat Williams interview with Shannon Sharp has to go down as one of the best interviews of all time. It's probably up there with Kanye's interview with um, Zane Lowe. You know the one where he's wearing a gold chain? Yeah, right? You remember that legendary interview, right? That Zane Lowe interview with the gold chain? I think this change, this um, Cat Williams interview with Shannon Sharp is up there with, there, um, with that interview. The only one that's going to top that maybe is when Kanye eventually goes on Shannon Sharp's um, platform, the Shay Shay, Club Shay Shay. Um, I know Koyla hates the name in it. Is it Club Shay Shay or Shay Shay, whatever? So um, I think the only way we'll top that is maybe, you know, again, Kanye going on there or somebody else going on there. But so far, it's been amazing. So I rewatched it again, pulled some clips that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, and one of the clips here that I want to highlight in this fucking beautiful pod is this the one with Cat Williams talking about being anti-work ethic and also being kind of counter hustle culture i think this is incredibly insightful and eye-opening and really interesting thing that he said because it's something that i've said a lot on this pod and something that i've kind of always had a bit of an issue with when it comes to hustle culture and survival bias and this whole pull yourself up by your bootstrap thing and whatever and the whole like thing that it, Joe Rogan preaches about oh everybody should have a podcast everyone should be out there making wooden furniture and selling it for, like all this nonsense shit about everyone needs to be an entrepreneur like the kind of Gary V uh, you know mindset of things where you know if you're not out here like working for yourself then you you're basically life doesn't matter when there's actually some value to be had in working a job when there's value in having you know supporting your family just doing a basic nine to five there's nothing completely wrong with that but these guys will make you feel as if like if you're not you know talking into a fucking microphone and you don't have a can of liquid death next to you then you haven't made it in life i fucking hate you so it's good to hear cat williams have the same mindset let's play the clip for you now but you could be a winner you could be a winner on this day it just it's just work ethic and not the work ethic they talk about they tell you work ethic where they do all these movies i'm the hardest working man well, no everybody goes to work every day but right yeah I'm saying, I go to work all the time. Everybody who works goes to work every day. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. You get, what? You think I respect you more than my gardener? I don't. I don't. He work every day. Rain or shine. I don't know if you saw this, but to... And I really do agree with him. And it's something that I've always felt um was annoying especially within my little scene of fashion and streetwear and shit there'd be this idea that somehow because you work a core job because you are like you know you work with some agency you're at some marketing agency you're at a fucking um you know you're at a brand you have you work for a magazine a photography studio that somehow you are better than the person that worked a regular nine to five and i really did push back against it especially because i was somebody that always cared a lot about fashion a lot about clothes a lot about stuff and malarkey but i wasn't necessarily bothered about the industry i'd rather just work a regular job and then partake in being a fan of fashion by buying the magazines and buying the clothes and watching the shows but doing it from afar i don't need to be in the thing to enjoy the thing but i do think there is a lot of utility a lot of good in just working a regular job and not being involved in anything like this idea that everybody has to be an entrepreneur that everybody has to be out here hustling and pushing themselves to do the maximum is really egregious and really dismisses the um, the you know the the things that most people just want out of life which is security an ability to look after their family an ability to enjoy certain things leisure activities and stuff most people just would like that like most people would be much happier having their job pay them an extra i don't know two hundred dollars five hundred dollars per month then this whole adage that they should be out there chasing their dreams chasing your dreams for isn't for everybody and it's not it shouldn't be put on the pedestal if you want to go out there and chase your dreams fair enough but no one should be running behind you patting you in your back because you decided to bet on yourself bet on yourself do your thing but it doesn't make you any better than anybody else i don't i don't think so and i've always kind of said this because in my sense in my head I've always been very driven. I've always been very self-motivated. I've always kind of wanted quote unquote more out of life, right? But I always thought that it was annoying that sometimes, I don't know, I'd be in situations and people would maybe use my ambition 
use my work ethnic as brendan will say as a way to put other people down and i would really be uncomfortable with that. i'd be uncomfortable with people trying to put me on a pedestal and use me as some sort of like oh look what he's doing you should be doing it's like no 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 no. i chose to do this because i chose to do it fair but that doesn't make me better than anybody because i chose to live my life a certain way or pursue certain things that doesn't make me better than anybody it's just something i chose to do it's like a hobby it just is what it is there's no reason you just put me on a pedestal i fucking hate that shit i thought that was really lame and if anything it kind of dismissed um the utility the fucking greatness or the good the goodness or the whatever maybe of just working a regular job and being a fucking good member of society you know um i think people should worry more about being truthful honest um members of society being a fucking credit to your community um helping your family in some way than just you know this whole idea of like oh i work hard i turn up at my job type of thing like why do you want to pat on the back for that you know what I mean? it's fucking disgusting but just to end it he's obviously talking about kevin hart he's obviously talking about kevin hart because as you know in the, i think he stopped it now but a few years ago kevin hart's whole mantra remember kevin hart be posting pictures of himself topless running all the time working out all the time right and his whole thing was like oh i'm the hardest working comedian and i think obviously people like burt crash do that also right by having a million tours and stuff blah 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 and you know using that as some sort of thing to like you know make himself look better than every, everybody else when really you know yeah you're the hardest working comedian but you're the hardest working comedian because you have people around you that allow you to fucking you know do what you're doing because you have assistants you have a whole team of people you know flying you around you know making sure you're dressed you're fed all these type of things add to it but these guys will make you think as if they're like superhuman doing it all by themselves and even if they were doing it by themselves who gives a fuck that's your job you turn up at your work like cat williams said you shouldn't be fucking you know waiting for a round of applause because you did your job that's not how the real life works so i'm happy that cat williams said that big up cat williams he's a fucking g and then the other clip that i thought was really interesting was this one regarding stand-up comedians and i thought this was interesting because this for me was an um interesting because i was thinking about it more in this lens of like djs because i feel like for some reason this doesn't happen in the dj world and i'm not really too sure why i've always wondered why don't more djs support each other why is it always like a one person in type of thing um you know people have their, there's usually like there's usually always like a cohort of these that come in maybe every four years i think that's what someone said i remember reading a book actually where they said like scenes last four years like every subculture no every scene within a subculture yeah there's subcultures but every scene within a subculture has a four-year cycle and i think that's right i remember when i was like running around dawson running around hackney running around parts of east london and south london throwing parties and being a man about town you know it was like a four-year run i remember we kind of sat, i had like a party that i used to do called so special and we had like a four-year party at the pub we used to do the parties that called the alibi and then i think after that four-year run the alibi kind of died and then a new group of people come in but then it kind of never, never was the same so most scenes within subcultures last four years right um so you get always like a new set of like artists and djs that come through every four years but for some reason in the dj world it dance music world there's not really a lot of support there's not a lot of people bringing people through how there is in stand-ups that stand-ups are always kind of bringing people through but i feel like in dj world it doesn't happen so let me just quickly play this clip from cat williams and then i'll speak on the other side who are some of your favorite young comedians i don't I haven't seen a young comedian I don't like. If you name any of the young comedians, I'm aware of all of them and they're all... You, you, you a teenager, he fine too. Like, what's gonna happen? Who are some of your favorite young comedians? Apologies for the replay. I don't... I haven't seen a young comedian I don't like. If you name any of the young comedians, I'm aware of all of them and they're all doing a great job. It doesn't matter if it's Country Wayne or Desi Banks. It doesn't matter if it's Carlos or Chico. It doesn't matter if it's uh, DC or just hilarious. It, do it really doesn't. It really doesn't matter once we go to the young part. Um, the young comedians are dealing with things that we never dealt with and so that gives them more benefits but it also gives them uh, more chances of failure so it's not easier for them um so yeah i'm i'm a big supporter of um young comics we we have uh, miss pretty ricky and takara williams um i've taken 25 
uh, black women on the road in these tours. Um, it's important to me that the young comic uh, gets the benefits and the advantages of the big comics platform. Right. Matt Ryan. So that was a really good um, reply there from Cat Williams, essentially highlighting a lot of like, you know, Instagram comedians, people on social media that you'd have to only know if you're plugged in. So it obviously shows that he's plugged in and paying attention. Um, but like I said, I just find it fascinating how upfront and forthright he is about bigging them up because, you know, a lot of the, especially DJ scene people, even podcasters and YouTubers, you see a lot of people just go, oh yeah, I don't know this person. I've never heard of them. I don't listen to them. As sort of like a weird slight on somebody, as sort of like a way to kind of put them down. But I feel like sometimes giving them the flowers and, you know, bringing them up is actually a good thing. And it's good to see that Cat Williams did that in this interview. And I would hope, I wish that we had the same thing in the DJ world, but it doesn't exist. I don't know why. A big up of Henry Poet, basically just because you have a dream that doesn't make you any better than those that don't. And I've met many people who have way more natural work ethic than celebrities. Exactly, Robert Henry Poet, exactly. Um, but going back to this topic, I just, I don't know. I just, I wonder what it is because maybe it's just competitive nature of DJing. Because I think maybe, because I, I look at similar to stand-up, but maybe it's not. Maybe, maybe there is less professional DJs out there than stand-ups maybe there is less space so when you do make it you don't want to you know invite other people into that slot because you know it's so hard for you to make it I get that but I just would wish there was a little bit more encouragement in that regard um for people uh, maybe that then could you know you could bring up a whole pe a group of people together and it would just be one it'd be a whole group of us coming together and maybe that would be a good way to kind of you know maybe push the scene a little bit forward and shit who knows who fucking knows um, I actually need to take a pill now because the side of my face is starting to throb. So let me actually do this before I play the new pill. So bear with me one second. Let me get another clip up on here and then I can quickly play this another clip because I need to fucking get, take this pill before I collapse. Uh, where is it? Da -da -da -da. What's this I want to play? Um, yeah, let's play this one. Cat Williams or Matt Rife and Jonathan Major. Let's play this a little bit. This is quite, yeah, this this one's a good one too. Cat Williams or Matt Rife and Jonathan Rogers being cancelled. Major, sorry, Jonathan Rogers. Jonathan Major's being cancelled and what happens off of in Hollywood. This, I think, is a really good insight as well from Cat Williams about cancel culture and shit. Um, this is a really good one too. Let's listen to him speak on this. Matt Rife, you know, you know him from uh, Wild and Out. He gets cancelled for trying, trying to tell I, a... I never knew him from Wild and Out, to be honest. Okay. I, I, I came across him as a new comic. Okay. And, um, yeah, I'm really just trying to see the comics, judge where they are, see it. Yeah. Right. Go ahead. So, the, the canceling, uh, the, what, what, what do you think about this cancel culture? You see the situation with Jonathan Major. I mean, for all sense and purposes, I, I don't know if maybe he can bounce back in, in a couple of years. But, man, he was, he was hot. He was hot. As, he was cooking. I mean, you see him in Creed. He's in the Marvel movies. And then just like that. Maybe I'm a conspiracy theory, but I thought Cal Williams said any that time they make you into that position, part of that contract is you do understand whenever we want to take you down, we can, right? Part of giving you the world. First of all, they went around the world for two years straight telling any women that would listen that this was a good looking Negro. Mm -hmm. Since when? When did y'all start liking a big nose? And <laughs> when did y'all like a little head and a big jaw? When? Since when? That look like my daddy. When you start liking my daddy? You like black people's features like that? If this ugly nigga is good looking, then all niggas is good looking. <laughs> Anytime you see them telling you something you can't believe, just understand it's a play. And it don't matter. You gonna know it's a play as soon as they get in that position and think they gonna tell somebody something. No, you're not. No, you're not. Yep, Marvel yep, yep. will cancel you so f You won't be allowed to read a comic book. <laughs> what is you talking about? Ah, get out of here. Get out of here, ugly boy. Uh uh, he's so right. He's so fucking right. But you know what I was thinking recently about Matt Rife? And I'm going to talk to the Matrix of Rages thing off. I actually think that was more bravery on his part as opposed to the industry saying, hey, we propped you up 
and now we're going to take you back down to earth. I actually think it was quite brave of him to do what he did. I wouldn't have done it personally, but I think it was quite brave. The Matt Rife story for me goes something like this. He comes up in the stand-up scene. He starts to blow up on social media. And for whatever reason, well, we know why, because he's a good looking dude. He's tense. He then decides, he then has a really big fan base of women following him all around the place. It's really disproportionate from most comedians. Most comedians probably have a lot of middle-aged men. He has all these women um, from any age of like 18 to fucking 65, absolutely in love with him. And I guess throughout that kind of a session when he's kind of building himself up on social media, he's getting a lot of hype. He has a little bit of a come to Jesus moment where he's like, you know what? I want to be regarded as a proper, legit stand-up comedian like all my heroes I look up to. I don't want to be seen as some pretty boy, um, you know, that only kind of gets laughs because women think I'm attractive. I want to be known for being really funny. So he decides to do a bit of a fucking 180. He decides to do a bit of self-sabotage and starts to talk about shit that he knows his predominantly women-based audience won't like to kind of, you know, to kind of uh, streamline his fan base, to kind of get rid of the people that he doesn't want to be his fans anymore and to kind of change the nature of his fans. I actually think that's quite brave. I actually think that's kind of brave. I swear to God. I think that's kind of brave that he did that that he went that direction because he could have easily just kind of did the good boy thing and carried on with his fans that he likes right i think he could have done that easily but the fact that he decided to change it and go the opposite way is pretty wild to be fair and you know it's gonna be fine because he's a fucking good looking white dude he's not gonna you know he's not gonna go back to working at fucking target or anything he's gonna land on his feet but i think that purposely doing that shows a lot of bravery especially in an industry where a lot of people kind of acquiesce and follow you know the path just to kind of make sure they have a career to go forward and shit when it comes to jonathan major stuff i think cat williams is spot on I do think he maybe got a little bit too big for his britches, as they say, um, or breeches. I forgot how the fucking term is. Um, he probably started walking around. I think what comes to mind is that um, quote from Kanye about Drake. He's walking around like he's pack, like he's Tupac or something, right? He thinks he's fucking untouchable. And I think Jonathan Majors had that point too. He was really hot. Um, a lot of the magazines were covering him, talking about how attractive he was. Women were falling over him. The roles he was doing was amazing. Um, forget the other roles he did. The role that I thought he was a stand-up breakthrough role was obviously was it creed and the other movie he did where he played like a fighter pilot i thought he was amazing in that like he actually showed range because you know him being like a big brute he can play that role but i thought that movie that jonathan major was in where he plays like a fighter pilot or something he was a, he was a really good in that movie really fucking good like an actual actor actor but obviously he got a bit too cocky i feel like he got a bit too complacent he didn't move correctly and he got punished you know he really got punished very quickly and he got kind of brought back down to earth and maybe that is a an unfortunate nature of being a big hollywood star you kind of have to acquiesce and play the game if you don't they can really slap you right back down to earth so that's the unfortunate side of it but to be fair i think you'll be fine i don't know i, I have a feeling they're gonna do like the opposite of like johnny depp with jonathan majors i feel like he's gonna go on a you know he's gonna go on like an apology tour and they're gonna slowly but surely introduce him back in i think they did the whole dropping him for a marvel thing was a bit performative but i think in general he'll be fine i honestly do think so i think he'll be fine i think they're gonna find a way to get because there's not a lot of black leading men that look like him out there so they kind of need him so i think they will find a way to kind of get him out there and hopefully if the if the public reacts well to his interviews and to him crying i think he'll be back on the big hollywood screen sooner rather than you know rather soon i bet you i've got a feeling I feel, I feel like there's a bit of a fix in play there's something going on in the background where they're trying to work out how they can kind of you know get him back in the good graces of the public especially if they can paint it in a narrative that he was kind of unjustly found guilty the fucking you know the legal system black man all this sort of shit i think they're gonna find a way i think all the dropping him and all that you know stuff was performative to make it look like they care but i feel like in the in the grand scheme of things they're gonna make sure that they kind of you know they kind of help him out so he can kind of come back on that's why i think so personally but hey what do i know what do I know? Moving on from that one, let's play another clip here. It's healthy. So this marijuana helps him do both of those things. Marijuana well, help you sleep? Oh yeah. 
Because he remember, good? remember, as a comedian, what you're doing is against your natural timeline. Your natural timeline wouldn't be that you would start your work day at eight o'clock p.m. Right. And then your work day is over at two thirty a.m. Like that's a weird. Yes. Right. So to tell your body now that we're pumped up on endorphins, now let's go to sleep at three. It don't work like that. Your body has to try to get a whole new schedule. So, you know, it suffered, but that's what worked for me. I consistently used it. I told people all across the country, don't worry, this will be legal in our country. As soon as they find out how to charge taxes for it, we will be legal in this country. Do they view me as some sort of visionary for my forward thing? No, no. You own drugs. <laughs> that's what I heard. <laughs> Yeah, but how you be, I mean, bro, every time they try to put you down. And that's the thing I've never understood with people. Like, the, I think I spoke about this on the pod before, like drug shaming. I've always thought drug shaming is lame, like as an ex, as a way to sort of like dismiss what somebody's saying or to put somebody down. Like the only way to really be on some sort of like moral, to, the only way to really morally grandstand or to be on some level of, have any level of superior contact when it comes to drugs is to not do them the only way to really scold people and to kind of look down on people is just to be sober or be teetotal that's the only way to do it if you do other drugs and not another drug then you know you i don't know it's sort of like throwing stones in a glass house like everything is they're all bad as each other we all just find ways to sort of like manage and kind of um do the best that we can with life right especially given the stress and the strains that we all have so if we sometimes have to lead into certain things to get you know to kind of get through life then so be it if some of us don't need it then cool but it doesn't make you better than the other person Jeremy. You know I mean? we all just kind of have to make do with what we kind of have but i always felt the drug shaming thing was very bizarre that people do but i feel like maybe sometimes there's a way of people to somehow maybe feel good about their situation maybe because they may be afraid of doing it they'll point fingers more at you because they feel like they they're not in control of their own things whatever maybe but i feel like the idea of like you know because you only drink coffee or because you only smoke cigarettes you're looking down on people that smoke weed is very bizarre because you are doing some form of drug you are dependent on something to kind of get through your day and some people just have different degrees some people are doing heroin on a daily basis like a functioning you know cr you know a, fu a functioning smackhead some people are just doing fucking pills some people are doing fucking weed whatever maybe some people are not doing anything and they're literally just drinking fucking and caramel tea it is what it is we all have our vices and we all just try to make the best of the life we're kind of given really so i liked that he said what he said i honestly did so big up cat williams oh and big up coiler too uh big up coiler in the chat coiler said what um um fucking what you call it he said in uh in the clip um he said if megan was a shoot yeah let's see if i can see shooter let's see if i can get shoot on the transcript uh he told me um shoot ting where is it not there okay someone posted okay cool someone posted a clip of okay cool thank you thank you robert henry poet thank you cat williams tory lanes let's see somebody already posted a clip of it that's really i thought i was the only person that heard it i thought i was special <laughs> Uh, big up the streamers big up the stream chat people watching appreciate you please make sure you're liking the stream if you enjoy what you see let's continue cool big up um robert henry perry for the tip let's play this clip and the man what, what was your take on that because i know you you got to take on everything I know it's, you a, it's a difficult position because somebody's not going to tell the truth and the truth has got to be told in all circumstances, the truth has got to be told. So if you don't want to say she shot her, then you shot her. And that's the end of that. Oh. And he's right. He's right. I'm glad he said that he's right. You know what? Am I the only person? Maybe I'm in the minority here. But when the whole Tory Lanez thing happened, I was very forthright in saying that I thought the responsibility and the blame was mostly on Tory Lanez's side. Even though I feel like to this day, I don't feel like he shot Megan Thee Stallion. I still feel like that situation was more his fault because he just got too excited. He fought with his dick and not with his brain. He was smashing Kelsey. He was smashing, he was smashing Megan behind Kelsey's back or Kelsey behind Megan's back. He went to Kylie's house and then tried to smash Kylie in front of both of the girls. He just did too much. 
he just did too fucking much and eventually it all blew up in his face and now he's sitting in fucking prison and megan's out here twerking in clubs and stuff it's unfair but he's mostly to blame but i was also very had unpopular opinion where i said to myself i understand why kelsey lied i understand why the other girl lied i got it i get it she just gave him birth to her kid she was just about to get married and shit like that's a life and death situation if no one's gonna say who did it i'm just gonna say i didn't do it so i think her going and getting that immunity deal and basically putting the blame mostly on tory's side was made a lot of sense self-preservation and i also understand why megan lied I'm not going to lie. I understand why Megan lied also because you have to you have to consider back in those days, think back to when that happened. Megan was hot as fish grease. She was kind of the darling of social media a little bit. No one really she didn't really have any smut on her name and no one really knew how she gets down behind the scenes. No one really knew about how Lucy Gucci she was, but fucking everybody under the sun and stuff. Everyone just assumed she was this nice cool girl. She had a whole college thing going on and shit, wherever it may be. I understand why she went out of the way why she went out of her way to make sure that she buried Tory because the Tory Lane situation was the first situation that kind of opened the door to people seeing how Megan is when she's out and about. Maybe she was an alcoholic, maybe she's drinking too much, maybe she's doing drugs, maybe she's partying too much, maybe she's a bit too loose. So I think that possibility of people finding out all her secrets would push somebody to the point where like, you know what, I'm going to point the blame at somebody else. So I completely understand why she did it. I completely get it. It's really sad, whatever it may be. But I also think if you're Tory and you didn't do it, you have to go out of your way to kind of point a finger at somebody else. The fact that he didn't do that, he didn't take to the stand and defend himself and point a finger at fucking Kelsey or something. It was obviously his biggest faux pas. And even though he had, his, you know, he kept his fucking, um, what's it thing called? He kept his morals in check and whatnot and integrity, all that sort of nonsense. You're still sitting in jail. You're still sitting in fucking federal prison, sorry. Um, if that was me, I would have fucking pointed a finger immediately, immediately at somebody else if they're, if I wasn't fucking um, responsible for it. So um, in general, I think every person in that story is a piece of shit, really, to be honest, <laughs> you know? Because that's something that people don't talk about enough more. Like people don't talk about it enough more, like how much of a piece of shit you have to be as Megan to fuck Tory behind your best friend's back. Because if, you, if the, sto the story goes something like this, um, they all meet together, but Kelsey ends up catching feelings for Tori first. They end up kind of hooking up a bunch and then she gets COVID. She catches COVID and she goes missing from the group a bit, right? Because she's recovering. And in that process of her catching COVID, Megan then starts fucking Tori behind Kelsey's back. Now, no one speaks about that. Like the fact that, you know, imagine doing that to your friend, somebody that was your best friend at that time. That's really fucking like conniving evil behavior you know when she's ill you then start fucking her guy behind her back without her knowing obviously and then it all kind of blows up her fucking kylie's house that's fucking crazy shit but again i think every person in that story from tori to kelsey to megan they all come out of it looking horrible um if anything it's a lesson for people out there especially guys i think that that was a major lesson for you to know like hey sometimes thinking with your dick can actually get you in actual trouble like we saw it when you think with your dick too much that's what happens you end up in fucking federal prison because you couldn't just relax so you know free tory but hey he's only got himself to blame only got himself to blame moving on from that one let's play the kanye clip and then we're gonna move on cat williams on kanye i thought this was very astute from him also what do you think about kanye rant what's going on with kanye from a distance, obviously, I don't know how well you know Kanye. I don't know if you've been around Kanye, but from a distance, what 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 do you suspect's going on? I suspect that we're pretty awful people if we say that somebody got a mental illness and then we watch what they do. Mm. If you say somebody got special needs, then why would you be watching them and holding them accountable? like everybody else. Mm. Wouldn't you grade them on a curve? Wouldn't you go, whew, this guy. Because, I mean, what are we reacting to? What are we reacting to? You're the one that put him in a position where he thought he was God and could call himself Jesus. And you're the one told a guy that writes musical lyrics that he was a genius. Mm -hmm. You're the one that's like, so what, what do you expect? The guy married a whore. Like what? Oh, Lord. Like, <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. I mean, married her because she was one. Not he didn't know. He understood that 
He wanted that. He courted that. That's what he wanted to base his family on. But maybe he got, he got a good heart, though. I know what you're going to say. Don't you say it, Kat. <laughs> Don't you say it. I'm going to move the conversation. If what I'm saying is not correct, then how does she end up with Pete Davidson? I mean, it happens all the time. And what if you weren't even good enough for Pete and he leaves you? Jesus. What do that mean the product was? Jesus Christ. No, I don't, I don't support or villainize Kanye because I don't understand what it is we want from him. I, I don't know why we look at a basketball player and say, he didn't score no hockey goals this whole season. <laughs> he don't play <laughs> hockey. <laughs> <laughs> Kanye don't say nothing I can agree with. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, he was the weird guy in the beginning with the pink sweaters right. when we met him. Like, yeah. what do you think moving to a beat of your own drum? This, this dude started a church and kept cussing. Nobody in black church said nothing. You would have thought all the pastors would have came. You can't be no gospel artist. You just said fuck that bitch. <laughs> Nobody said nothing. Because T.D. Jake's over there with Pete in it. Like, oh, man, come on, cat. Only the guy you had here. Oh, I love the T.D. Jake slander. I love the T.D. Jake slander, man. Fuck T.D. Jake's. Um, this is very true and something that I've always had the biggest issue with when it comes to Kanye's um, group of sycophants and enablers around him. That's why I was really kind of, you know, smiling out of one side of my mouth when that whole Tremaine Emery stuff started going down when he was beefing with him because I felt for the longest time when before Kanye had that kind of freak out where he started supporting Trump and started wearing the MAGA hat and that's when the first sort of phase of you know Kanye kind of losing it in public happened I was always of the thinking that that didn't come out of the blue a lot of people behind the scenes had knowledge or were keenly aware of what was going on with Kanye and what his mental state was like but back then he wasn't out in public saying he liked Hitler saying you know he fought the fucking you know um um, he thought Hitler said a lot of good things or being super anti-Semitic or uh, being a super anti-Semite and shit. He wasn't out there and flagrantly doing that back then, but he was probably doing it behind the scenes because there was obviously accounts of people saying him saying questionable shit back in the days. But people excused it or turned a blind eye to it because they got a lot from it. They went to flipping fashion shows. They got to be at Yeezy catwalk shows. They got to be at fucking, you know, his music fucking activation events type of things. Everybody got a lot of Kanye or they even just got free stuff, right? Um, and they were happy to turn a blind eye. But the moment it got into public and the moment it got fucking, you know, obviously got into the kind of public consciousness, how he was acting and shit, suddenly everybody went quiet and they had nothing to say. Because when Kanye was sending them shoes, you see people People, especially people on my feed like all these fucking you know johnny come lately idiot type people on my instagram will be posting pictures of themselves getting seeded certain yeezy products when it dropped and shit thank you kanye thank you team yeezy but in the moment he started stepping out saying some wild shit when he first started going crazy everybody was fucking mute no one had a thing to say and that is definitely proof to me that if anything yes kanye has his faults i think as most incredible artists are i think personally you're always going to suffer a bit when you're somebody that's really operating on that sort of high level of flipping artistry your personal life and how you interact with people isn't going to be the greatest but i honestly do think that for the longest time he has been enabled from the minute he showed any sort of promise from the minute he showed any sort of level of really high functioning ability and artistry is almost genius level i think that people immediately started to give him a lot of fucking leeway and started to turn a blind eye to his bullshit and never called him out so if anything the industry enabled him yes he might be a piece of shit yes he obviously as um young old vibe saying kanye does seem exhausting i understand that but i honestly do think that he never got checked from the beginning because kanye was always valuable he was always a valuable resource he was always somebody that was going to make like like the elon thing we spoke about earlier people are concerned about elon taking drugs no they're not they're concerned that Elon might take too much drugs and might OD and die and then their investment dies with it because most people know those companies only really are around and only are prominent because of Elon's fucking pushing them and being prominent out there. Same comes to Kanye. People enabled Kanye. People kind of turned a blind eye to his behavior, the thing that he said because he was making their money, whether through Yeezy stocks, whether through just being who he was, whether through employing them because I think Kanye is probably one of those people too. He probably, Kanye probably has people on his payroll Kanye people probably pays people on his payroll that he has never met he probably has people on his payroll he doesn't even know 
literally pays them on a monthly basis and he doesn't even know them he has so many people probably around him leeching off of him sucking him dry but obviously because he makes so much money he probably fucking doesn't even notice it but those people are the ones that are to blame i think for his mental state and for where he's gotten to because they never once checked him because they never wanted to have their fucking water turned off as they say i'm fucking back on fig no one wanted to get their water turned off so they just kept letting him get away with shit and of course it got to a point where he couldn't get away with shit but even till now we saw the recent video of him at that listening party thing he did in Miami. All the fucking groupies around him nodding away as he's fucking talking absolute shit. He's going on crazy tangents. And again, I'm I'm Kanye's my guy. Kanye's my goat. But even I can say he's talking fucking shit for the most part. Most of his rants nowadays aren't hitting the same because he's legitimately, you can see from how he's talking, he's definitely mentally ill. You can see from the tangents he goes on, the topics that he jumps from from time to time, how he gets so worked up in such a little space of time that he's clearly going through it but again no one wants to say anything no one wants to do anything because he's too big of a star now to really try to help in any way shape or form because he has basically insulated himself from the real world by surrounding himself with a lot of yes men and yes women unfortunately but i do agree with cat williams the public are kind of to blame you put this guy up on a pedestal you called him a god you made him feel like everything he said was the deepest most inspirational forward-thinking thing that he ever said it's no wonder that he started to believe the hype he walks around like he's a god he acts like it he thinks he can get away with what he can get away with and so far to be honest to him so far he's been proven right right he's been proven right most people in his position especially being a black man would never be able to get away with what he got away with. but because of his talent there's still that hope that people have that he's going to turn it around when in my personal opinion i don't think so i think this Kanye we got now is the Kanye we're going to get until the until the day he dies he's too old he's too set in his ways he's made too much money why would he change now you know like what was the point we just saw him recently at the show that he did in miami where he started wearing the fucking black kkk hood like you know he's gonna be this edge lord thinking trying to get a reaction out of people dude until the moment he dies unfortunately because you know why the fuck not but i think the public and obviously the industry people around him have a lot to blame have a lot of blame to hold to because they enabled that guy and they let him get away with murder and never called out his shit so it's no surprise that he's the way he is now but still um um, you know i love him for the music for the design stuff so i'm still gonna keep an eye out for him and root for the guy but when it comes to him personally like you know again i'm not the biggest fan of the kardashians but jesus christ can you imagine being married to that guy can you imagine having four kids of that guy can you imagine trying to like get that guy to behave at like a family dinner or something can you imagine how exhausting and tiring and frustrating it must be to try and wrangle Kanye or try to get him to like just take his meds or something or go seek help like can you imagine how difficult that must have been for them <laughs> again I don't care for the Kardashians but I do kind of feel for for Kim on that whole thing I really do feel for him a little bit um but hey what can he do to end the cat williams section let's do this one the joe rogan one because i feel like this is really important to talk about and this is going to obviously tying in with the topic of the fucking the title of the podcast regarding gatekeepers now um i have to set out my store here i've said from the beginning that i don't think it's fair to blame joe rogan for brendan Shaw. And let's not look at Brendan Shaw as a person. Let's look at him as what he encapsulates, at what as what he encapsulates, and what he represents in terms of being the person who is a recipient of like a very influential person opening the door for them, a very influential person giving them a platform, a very influential person guiding them through and you know teaching them the ropes and shit. I don't think, and I said this from the beginning, that you can blame Joe Rogan for Brendan Shaw, but the more I grow up, the more experience I get in life, the more things I see and stuff, I can kind of understand why some people have that thinking. Because unfortunately, because of Rogan's platform, because of his success, he has now become a de facto authority on stand-up comedy. Even though he isn't, he's become that because he has the biggest platform and because he himself is a stand-up comedian of like 20 plus years. So naturally, because he's inviting, because he's very welcoming and he's very, he invites everybody on his platform to kind of share their story and to connect with his fan base and maybe grow their fan base, which is something that people don't really give him enough credit for because I've always said this on before my random show streams that I honestly do think if you gave anybody else in stand-up comedy the same power and platform that rogan has they would never do what rogan did in terms of making his platform open to every comedian like there's there'll be times he doesn't do it as much now but there was times back in the day where rogan would have these guys on from boston 
these guys on from fucking Boston that he can have come up in comedy with guys that you would only know if you know the Boston fucking stand up scene and he'd had them on his podcast guys that have like a thousand followers or something because he just loved and appreciated them for the inspiration they gave him back when he was starting out blah 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 none of those other guys nowadays will do that so give him credit for doing that he's definitely a full leader in that and definitely set the precedent but unfortunately because of the size of his platform he's now become an authority and because of his wanting to help his friends that being that being an authority he i wouldn't say he abused it but he was maybe a bit irresponsible with who he gave a platform to or who he basically highlighted because what you've seen now with the brendan Shaw thing is that you've seen this reaction from the public where they're like this is insulting to our intelligence because this guy's not funny He's just, a, he's not even a decent human being, let alone funny. But here he is being propped up by one of the biggest comedians, biggest personalities, biggest stars, biggest show in the world. And you're basically forcing him down our fucking throats when we don't want to see him. And obviously now off the back of that, he's now got a successful career, not was a successful career, but he's got a career in the entertainment industry, Brendan, and be able to kind of, you know, take that fucking shine and obviously do his own thing. But I think that's the main issue. The main issue is that, it's basically an insult to most people's intelligence to see somebody who's not good at what they do be propped up by somebody who's got a big platform and obviously be able to kind of, you know, um, take that and obviously run to the hills. And then, of course, the other thing that's frustrating is that over time, it then becomes a little bit of a click thing. And even though Joe Rogan and a few of the other people talk about being anti-Hollywood, they've kind of created their own Hollywood industry, their own gatekeepers their own kind of close click thing by doing the podcast because there are certain people within that joe rogan universe the Bapaverse, who are not included who are not invited and if they're not invited it almost feels like they're not as funny when they are right because joe rogan highlights certain comedians he talks about his friends a certain way this guy's a beast this guy's a monster this guy's selling he makes it seem like all his friends are the best comedians when really they're not they're just his friends the people outside of his friendship group might be the best but we don't know because we don't see them on his platform so it's kind of like um it's kind of like a double-edged sword it's kind of like a blessing and a curse he's got this platform it's amazing because he gets the time to highlight his friends and put them out there and blow them up but the other side of it is that because he's got the platform it then gets abused by people who are not talented and have no right being a stand-up comedian like Brendan Schaub, right? He Because I, I still would believe that I blame Brendan more for Brendan than Joe. I don't think you can fault Joe for trying to help out his friends. But obviously, I can see why people can look at Br Joe with another kind of eye. So let me play the clip anyway. A long ramble there. But let me play with the clip of what Cat Williams said. Time that this is happening... Cat Williams is known for smoking weed. Willie Nelson is known for smoking weed. Right. Snoop's known for smoking weed. But none of us is really known except Willie. And I'm saying, Chris Tucker didn't want to be the poster child for smoking weed. He don't right. smoke weed like right. that. Right. He in the church. He Michael Jackson's best friend. Christmas. Michael Jackson called him Christmas. <laughs> you ever met a man that gave you a little nickname like that? No. Mm -mm, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> Must be the greatest. Man, I ain't gonna be able to get nobody back. Or I ain't gonna be able to get no more comedians. They all coming. No, they ain't. Are you kidding? Nah. Hey, I promise you. I done got all the rest I, of them. I done, got, I done got the ones. I promise you, everybody trying to double back. You're gonna be having to beat them off with a stick. <laughs> you won't let him. They're coming. Much as. <laughs> you're on deaf comedy jam comic view what were those experiences like what do you what do you remember most about deaf comedy jam and comic view uh comic view was everything um comic view was really the break um and not friday after next just because comic view was just three thousand of your stand-up peers and we just throw sets of all of them up there and we see who the audience likes who do they like 
And um, it was a great wild, wild west time to be involved in comedy. And um, the same is true for Def Jam because uh, hip hop was a fad at one time. Hip hop ain't gonna last, and why are you doing that? Um, and that's how it was for blue comedy. Mm -hmm. um, if you were a comedian that cussed, you were ridiculed by the mainstream comedy mm -hmm. geist. That would be like me being on Joe Rogan. Joe don't want me on there. I need to be on Shannon. Joe, Joe got six comedians that never been funny. He want to push out. <laughs> 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 And that's the problem. The problem isn't the platform. I think the problem is the legacy of Brogan platforming some of his friends who then turn out to be shit stand-ups. That's the issue because now it looks like, now it looks like he was purposely platforming people who are terrible, you know, because the ones that are good don't get on his show for some reason because he's not friends with them, obviously. But the ones that are, the ones that probably are debatable are the ones that are on the show all the time. So it kind of creates a weird vibe around the clip of people that he's with. But I also think the name that he said, when he said six, I don't think that was a particular six. I think that was just him, you know, saying the term. But I think if we tw if we went to list, obviously Brendan will be in the six. Brendan Shaw will definitely be in it. Maybe Burt Kreischer. I wouldn't say Ari because I think Ari is actually funny. I wouldn't say Tom Segura either, even though he's going through a bit of a difficult time now with his fans and annoying people and being a bit of a dickhead online. I still think he's quite funny himself. Um, I would definitely say a Whitney Cummings would definitely be on the list. Definitely Tony Hinchcliffe would be on the list. I can't think of a few others. I'm thinking that close to his group of circle of friends. There's probably a few more others on there. Um, obviously, um, who's that Asian dude? That fucking Rogan was sucking him off so hard. Um, is it Hans Kim or something? He's awful. Big up KP. Appreciate you, KP. It gets dicey, Bubba. You know it. You know it, KP. Big up, big up, KP for the super chat. Appreciate you. It definitely gets dicey, 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 brother. Thank you for the super chat, bro. Um, yeah. So those people are main, are are main, are named that the hands came of those like likes. They would definitely be in it. But I felt like Rogan's response to Cat Williams saying that on Twitter was interesting because it feels like ever since he's moved to Austin, I feel like Joe Rogan has gone out of his way to try to rewrite the wrongs of how he used to act when he was in LA. And I think a good example of that is that Rogan's refusal to let Brendan Shaw perform at the Comedy Mothership. I think his refusal to let Brendan Shaw perform there is an indication that he wants to rewrite the wrongs. He's seen that he's maybe been a bit, I won't say irresponsible, but maybe he's been a bit too willy-nilly with who he's allowed on his pod. And maybe his pod has inadvertently endorsed people who are, aren't legitimately funny and it's maybe hurt his credibility. So he's gone out of his way to now reset how he invites people on his show. So now he's become a proper gatekeeper, which is weird, isn't it? But because in the past he let Brendan appear on shows in the comedy store and stuff when he was in LA then he moves to fucking Austin and suddenly he's like nah you can't perform me you're not funny enough so I think this response was in line with that um he obviously saw the clip of Cat Williams saying that Joe don't want me here Joe got six comedians that ain't that funny he wants to push out and Joe replied to the tweet and said I love Cat he's one of my favorite comics and I'd love to have him on we talk about him all the time if he's down I'll make it happen so Rogan's inviting um Cat Williams to Joe Rogan podcast and obviously that would be an amazing pod right off the back of the Shannon Sharp interview I think Cat Williams on Joe Rogan will be fucking sensational especially off the back of what he said here so I think he'll deliver some home truths to Joe but I think this is a weird kind of like cope um obviously Joe's not gonna be happy with him basically saying what he's saying because essentially you are basically put into question Joe's funny also by saying that he's got people that aren't funny that he's pushing out there and Cat also didn't say that Joe was funny he, you know he just said he pushed people that aren't funny so if you're Joe you're going to be a little bit miffed and annoyed by it but this is probably a classy way to respond but it also feels like a bit of a cope um, and a bit of a way to kind of shield you from kind of feeling a bit offended but if anything this is another example as to how the podcast comedy bubble thing is blowing up and people are not really falling for it anymore there's a lot more naysayers vocal people out there calling people out obviously channels online like the two ladies to try as a podcast cringe a comedy enforcement all those type of people are putting out great videos basically dissecting and kind of calling out some of the nonsense out there but i feel like even the fans are responding 
you see a lot of people in the comments talking about it especially in the reply to the tweet and it's clearly kind of stirred up a lot of feelings with people in the industry or in the scene in general as to all this kind of pushing of people who aren't that funny from a rogan standpoint especially because a lot of people out there um think that rogan isn't funny himself there's a big con there's a big you know community of people out there that think rogan isn't funny so what business that he does he have to tell people or to like you know be the fucking gatekeeper of fucking comedy they don't fucking get it so i love that response from cat williams and i'm ram i am so looking forward to him going on the fucking joe rogan experience i really hope it happens i really fucking hope it happens i swear to god i'm doubtful but i hope it does happen i really don't hope <laughs>